Okay, thank you, Helen. And no problem for jumping me. I was saying that I was enjoying the previous talk. It was very good. Uh, so we started with uh, GSQ. Uh, actually, we started officially one month ago. Uh, two projects looking at the critical minerals in Northeast Queensland. One of them is uh, looking at indium mineralization bar gamma deposit, and the other one is looking at the potential for nickel, uh, scandium, cobalt, and chromium mineralization with thermophics. So both of these projects are going to be run as PhD projects. As you can imagine, we don't have uh, any results so far. Actually, one of the students just started less than three weeks ago. Uh, but I'm going to entertain you for a, probably about 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so. So the first project in the Milan Bar Gammon, it's uh, done to a PhD student. His name is Avish Kumar. Uh, he has a, a chemistry background. He's worked in an uh, industry for a few years. And uh, I think it's very uh, suitable for this project. So this project aims uh, to investigate the mineralogy and paragenesis and your chemistry of indium and bar gammon deposits and other similar occurrences in the region. Also, determine the distribution of indium in the host rocks, identify factors controlling the location formation of indium, and discovers probably some mineralogical, technology, or chemical zoning patterns that can be used as vectors to, to all. So a quick background, probably Vladimir earlier already presenting something similar. Uh, this map of Australia shows the occurrence and resources of indium in, uh, in Australia. Uh, you can see that Northeast Queensland is uh, particularly well represented from this aspect. There are a few uh, locations where there is a resource calculated and there are a few, uh, a few other number, a few other occurrences. Uh, however, even though we, we have this uh, indium occurrence and very little is known about the geology of, uh, of Indium. In terms of Bargammon deposit, Bargammon is uh, really okay, Northeast Queensland in the Herberton province. The geology in uh, that part of the world is dominated by the Hodgkinson province and the intrusion of a series of, of uh, granites uh, and volcanics of um, uh, Permian, uh, Carboniferous to Permian in age. Uh, more locally where the um, the Bargamon deposit located, the image on the top to the right. Uh, it's, uh, the geology is really mostly Hodgkinson formation and there are some rhyolites uh, and um, volcanics and porphyries. Now, as part of this project, Avish, when he started, he started uh, almost a month and a half ago, he started putting together a, a database of uh, indium deposits or location around the world where there is a resource calculated for indium. And it came out with quite a large variety of, uh, of depositals where indium can be found. You can see this in this table. So indium, it's, uh, it's relatively common in terms of, um, of high abundance and occurs in, uh, in epithermal, granite-related, Mississippi Valley type, porphyry deposits, polymetallic veins, SEDEX, CARN, and VMS deposits and also in quite a large variety of tectonic settings. Uh, but if you look closely through these um, deposits, in general, indium is, uh, does not form its own minerals and its, um, it, uh, its own mineralization, but rather occurs as uh, associated with, uh, with sphalerite, chacoparate, or other primary sulfide minerals, of which uh, sphalerite is the main mineral. So because Avish has a, has a background in, in chemistry, he started playing over the last month with a little bit with thermodynamic modeling. And he tried to model the incorporation of, um, of indium and, uh, and copper into, into sphalerite structures. So at this image at the top, you have a, a sphalerite structure. And he modeled incorporation of uh, one atom of copper into the sphalerite structures in here on the left and then another atom of copper and see what's happening left hand side. So the result of incorporating copper into uh, sphalerite structures results into a tightening of the, of the structure. So as you incorporate more copper into the structure, that, uh, the structure becomes more tighter. In other words, puts strain on the structure. Once you start incorporating zinc into the, into the um, sphalerite structure, indium into the sphalerite structure, replacing zinc, 
it, uh, it has the opposite uh, effect and actually start to relaxing the structures. And you have shown with these arrows the relaxing uh, direction. So the net effect when you incorporate uh, indium and copper into the spherarized structure, which is a couple substitution, is you deform the spherarized structure quite consistently. And if you browse through the literature and you find examples of uh, spherarized uh, grains which have high indium content, you will actually see with TM, TM images that actually is highly, the structure is highly disturbed. So this probably can be a good thing in terms of extracting indium um, out of sphalerite, uh, even directly without, uh, not necessarily as a byproduct, because it could be made easily to relax. So another thing that he's done, he played again with thermodynamics, he calculated the uh, thermodynamics of these incorporations. And what you have here is um, uh, some, uh, some numbers illustrating this uh, process. So, uh, down bottom here on this axis is the enthalpy. And you see that when you incorporate the copper into the, here that, that's no incorporation, it's a spherarized structure. When you start incorporating one copper uh, atom into the structure, the enthalpy starts to increase a little bit. You incorporate another copper, increases a little bit. However, that's nothing. So the tightening of the structure does not produce that much of a couple of, uh, Copper does not put that much of a problem for sphalerite. But the moment you start incorporating indium, the enthalpy increases significantly. Uh, and as you start incorporating more indium and copper, the enthalpy increases uh, even higher. And uh, the, this results in, in some uh, funny shape on the Van der Waals distribution energy, which uh, Avish interprets that this uh, could be related to the mechanism of incorporation and also the energy requires to incorporate uh, indium into, into the sphalerite structure. So I don't have much more to say about this. He's still working to this and is calculating some, uh, some more of these uh, processes. But apparently at the moment, one step takes half an hour and uh, he has 2000 steps. So I don't know how long that will be, a few, a month probably. Uh, so I'm going to start talk quickly a little bit about the nickel, scandium, and cobalt uh, project. Uh, so here we also have a PhD student. His name is uh, Alexander Edgar. He's a JSU graduate. He's done his honors looking at scapolite uh, in Mount Isa. So the, his project aim is to map the distribution and setting of ultramorphic complexes in northern Queensland. I would like to add here that it's very little to almost nothing known about the ultramorphic complexes in Queensland. Where they occur, what is their special uh, context, and how they fit into the tectonics and metallogenetic uh, story of the region. Also to investigate their mineralogy and geochemistry and petrogenesis of these rocks, determine their nickel, cobalt, scandium, and chromium content, and assess their potential for mineralization and see if we can um, establish some kind of criteria for exploration for this uh, type of mineralization. So this map of Northeast Queensland shows the, the two main locations where at the moment ultramorphic complexes are known. So one is in the Green, Greenvale uh, region and is related to, to Oterozoirov. One is in the Hodgkinson uh, formation along the coast. But uh, two years ago, we found another location just north of town, and I will show you at the end some slides for there, which seems to be kind of an interesting uh, story coming out of there. So in terms of uh, the Greenbelt province, the ultramorphic complexes sit along um, a major fault with uh, the, along the contact between the Greenbelt and Broken River province. And there are, as probably some of you know already, uh, some well-established nickel resources, such as in the Sconey, the SCONI project, but there, there are much more numerous uh, occurrences of, uh, of this type of uh, uh, metals. On the Hodgkinson province along the coast, there are two main occurrences. One is just south of uh, southwest of Innisfail. So it's outcropping along the road as you drive towards Innisfail on the left hand side. Uh, so as you could drive from Tali towards Innisfail, I don't remember exactly how many kilometers, but you end up with uh, on the left hand side with a high hill. As you drive across, there is a cutting on that high hill. And if you stop and you look right, you clearly will like, you can identify serpentinites and ultramorphic rocks. So this hill is about four to five kilometers long. 
more or less a kilometer wide. Uh, if you talk to locals in the area, they will tell you that um, in early 1900s, there were um, Chinese workers, they were working at the, at the port there, they were uh, mining gold, but also there seems to be some <coughs> Uh, high values reported for, for nickel and, uh, and cobalt. Another uh, large area of, of currencies in the Ultramaf complex in Northeast Queensland is just west of uh, Port Douglas, and that uh, out, it's outcropping for, it has about 15 kilometers long. We don't know almost anything about this area. However, there are reported some high values in, uh, in these commodities and could be of potential commercial uh, interest. Localized uh, outcropping of uh, ultramorphic rocks occur within the Barnard uh, metamorphics just along the coast. And again, very little is known about the extent and uh, the metallogeny of, this, um, of these rocks. So I'm gonna take you now just to north of Townsville. So on this map on the left, you have here is the coast. And right here, this uh, square highlights the Charters Towers province. So here it's a uh, a zoom in of the Charters Towers province. And in Charters Towers province, we have a series of metamorphic complexes such as Charters Towers metamorphics, Cape River metamorphics, Argentine metamorphics, and Irani River metamorphics. And these are, are about order vision uh, in age um, of this metamorphics. Their interpretation has been generous only in the Beccar settings. And I'm going to show you some data from the Running River metamorphics. And the zoom in and a close up map, which done one of my other students of years back. So, this is a map of the running river metamorphosis. They occur as a series of slivers uh, just at the contact between uh, the Broken River province and Charter Stowers province. And somewhere here is actually supposed to run the Clark River Fall. So, what my student found in this particular area, they found a series of outcropping ultramorphic rocks. And these ultramorphic rocks, they return uh, 13,000 ppm chromium. And after that initial found, his focus was not on the ultramorphic rocks. We went and we sampled again a few of other these outcropping uh, ultramorphics, and uh, they consistently return above 12,000 ppm uh, uh, chromium. Now, these ultramorphic rocks occur together with, um, with basalts, uh, um, which are uh, at the moment metamorphic amphibolite fascias. And there is a gneiss uh, sitting at the base of uh, all of this and they are included by, uh, by tonalites. With the ultramorphics and with the amphibolites, there are a series of, uh, of quartzites. So in this quartzite, we found something interesting. So the image on the left here shows a garnet, uh, a garnet uh, grain, which is um, this uh, quartzite associated with the amphibolites. And you can see this garnet grain has a core right here. And in this core, you may be able to see all of these trails or lines. If you zoom in, in this core, you start seeing this, uh, these trails that they seem to follow crystallographic uh, uh, structures of the garnet. They also, at the moment, they seem to be uh, kind of here. They are decorated by uh, strings of inclusion, uh, in fluid inclusions. They do resemble pretty much planar deformation features which you see in impact structures. I'm not sure if they are in the planar deformation features, but that's what they, they resemble. And another thing you find in the core of these garnets is this uh, exolution of uh, rutai lamellae, also following uh, certain crystallographic faces. Uh, we didn't do much work on this, but uh, if you scan to the literature, you will find out that a rutile exolution lamellae in, uh, in garnet, they usually occur at high pressure to an ultra high pressure uh, and high temperature, ultra high temperature metamorphism. So this may indicate that we may have had in uh, this part of the world almost eclogite uh, fascist metamorphism. And actually some of these ultramorphic complexes may represent um, actin suture zones. Uh, if we start thinking now along those lines and the geochemistry of these muffy rocks indicate have uh, strong arc affinities, we may start thinking of accretion of arcs into the Northeast Queensland and probably opens the potential for uh, different type of uh, mineralizations. So that's all I have. I want to thank GSQ for funding these projects and thank you for your time.